Um, before we start, I think Andrew, Andrew, Andrew was going to make an announcement, but I need to get him to come down. Hi everyone, uh, just a, a quick announcement. As many of you know, uh, there's a, um, an alumni reception at uh, Casa Italia after, immediately after this, and there are still some tickets available. So if, you have, if you're anybody actually in the room who's interested in, in uh, coming to the reception, just walk over to Casa Italia. It's only $20, uh, and it'll be a festive event to celebrate the kickoff of the 50th anniversary and talk with all the people here and talk about all the great talks that we've had today. So I hope I'll see you all there. Great. Well, thank you all for staying for the, for the afternoon and for the colophon of the, of the day. It is a real uh, honor and a pleasure to introduce uh, President Michel Pierre-Louis, who is really um, when you think of the great tradition of humanism, she really represents that. Uh, she is somebody that has shown her engagement to public life through her work in politics and through her work in nonprofits. She has worked um, tirelessly to elevate the, um, the level of discussion about the public good and the level of involvement of all of us in, uh, in just causes. And uh, she's, she, her extraordinary career is really um, one that, that uh, deserves a biography. Um, she was named Prime Minister of Haiti in 2008, and she is currently the founder and president of the Fondation Connaissance et Liberté, Knowledge and Freedom. And what a, what, a, what a great name for a foundation, knowledge and freedom. Uh, we should all be so lucky as to be able to achieve those two things in our lives. Um, she is a member of the Open Society Foundations, the Soros Foundations Network, which focuses on the areas of education, culture, community development, environment, gender equity, civil society endeavors. Through her foundation, Focal, she coordinated special projects related to Haiti's post-earthquake reconstruction efforts. From 1989 through 2006, she was a member of the journal Chemin Critique, for which she wrote several articles on politics, economics, arts, and culture. And so she has been able to elevate her work in the field, her practice, uh, into, uh, into the highest levels of academic uh, scholarship. She has received several awards and distinctions in her career, including a doctorate honoris causa in the humanities from San Michel College in Vermont. And from September through December 2010, she was a resident fellow at Harvard University's Kennedy School of Government Institute of Politics. Today, she will be lecturing on the idea of resourcefulness. Join me in welcoming President Michel Pierre-Louis. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Professor, for your very kind introductory words. Um, I'm the last speaker Usually the last speaker has a very challenging task. Everyone is tired or everything has been said. So I will try to be consistent with what I have written because uh, as uh, Madame Cafagioni said this morning, English is not my native language. So I, I'm the old fashioned, I have written something and I will show you a few slides 
of the work we've been able to do in Haiti in the past years. But I want to start by thanking Professor Otero Pairos and also Erika Avran of the World Monuments Fund, who is now, I think, an assistant professor at the School of Architecture here at Columbia University. I met Erika when Focal, the executive director, who is also here with me, and myself when we visited the World Monuments Fund in New York five years ago. Our discussion led to a very strong and productive partnership between our two institutions. And together with a third important partner, the Wallon Heritage Institute, we launched a daring, very daring restoration project, the Gingerbread House Preservation Project in Port-au-Prince, after the devastating earthquake of 2010 that crippled our capital city of Port-au-Prince. Since then, we have been working on the project that is one of the exemplary models of resourcefulness I want to talk to you about this afternoon. Foucault, the foundation, was not created 19 years ago to work in preservation of architectural heritage. You know, I am an economist. I'm not an architect. I'm not a preservationist. So you must wonder why I'm here. I'm an accidental preservationist. So we were not created to work in preservation of architectural heritage, nor to create a public park in a fragile neighborhood, which is the second experience I will talk about. Our mission was, and still is, to empower people, mostly the disenfranchised of our society, to build and reinforce capacity, to raise consciousness in practical ways about democratic values and citizenship at the grassroots level. To engage in such daunting challenges in quite adverse conditions, we had to have a sense of history, target elements of memory and culture of common interest, and be vigilant enough to seize the opportunities in time that connect with our mission. Saving a wooded area in Port-au-Prince before it was destroyed and preserving historical gingerbread houses after the earthquake were such privileged moments in time. <coughs> Preservation of historical national, cultural, and natural resources is a very recent preoccupation in Haiti. This morning, Professor, you mentioned that it is a very recent preoccupation elsewhere, but in Haiti, it's very recent. A country whose very singular history has left us with a wealth of monuments and artifacts from the different civilizations who inhabited this land. The Taino, whom Columbus called Indians when the Europeans first landed on the island over 500 years ago. The Spanish, the British, the French, the Americans who occupied the territory successively or simultaneously during two centuries. And of course, the Africans who came in chains and led the only successful slave revolutions of modern times. Our first governments build monuments that we should be very proud of, but are we? Indeed, some of us are aware of the rich heritage accumulated throughout the years. But at the same time, we often feel at a loss when facing the degradation of such monuments, places, archives, and artifacts due to indifference or, and or ignorance. The first decades of the 19th century were marked by a constant threat of an invasive return of the foreign powers, mostly France, to recapture the former rich colony. The war of independence left the country in ruins and utterly isolated from the rest of the world, which was still ruled by slave trading colonial powers. In order to gain some recognition as a sovereign state, our singular black Jacobin Republic consented to an obligation to compensate former French plantation owners 
thus contracting a crippling national debt. What meager resources left were mobilized for the army and branches of power. At the time, for the educated, heritage meant pride in our revolution, in our war heroes, the defense of the territory, a paradoxical attachment to the French language, and an affirmed sense of our conquered liberty and sovereignty. For, for the former slaves who became peasant farmers, their sense of heritage was to be found in the cosmogony of their gods, the myths and spiritual beliefs they carried with them on the slave ships and which no one was able to take away from there, even in their inhuman conditions. This shaped their existence as free men and women and gave meaning to life, sickness, and death. But it did not necessarily give them an idea of the importance of the fortress that was, that was built not too far from their rural habitat or the remains of a sword or a Taino artifacts found while plowing their land. Except for a few individuals who had a sense of the importance of this heritage, the legacy from the past embodied by fortresses, palaces, churches, and all types of form, and did not gain much consideration from governments, from the elite, nor from the population in general. Only on rare occasion did a president show concern for monuments of the past and dared to suggest how consubstantial they were to our identity. I will show you a few illustrations of those monuments and sites that are, most of them are still, they still need to be preserved. I think I have to press this. So this is our national palace, which was built in 19, started in 1920 and was, uh, <laughs> inaugurated in 1929, and it was a landmark and a symbol in Haiti of power. And this is the same palace right after the earthquake. And uh, it has been torn down and uh, has not been rebuilt since. This is the citadel. It's not a very clear view, but the citadel was built, the, the construction started in 1805 uh, and was finished in 1820, and uh, until 1979, uh, when uh, the Institute for the Preservation of National Heritage was created, uh, was it, it was really degraded. And it's, a, it's an incredible monument, which uh, together with the palace, this is an, an outer part of the citadel, with the palace of uh, Sans Souci, they became, uh, they were inscribed on UNESCO World Heritage List in 1981. Uh, the palace has not been renovated yet, but there's a huge UNESCO project renovation with, uh, with architect Albert Mangones, who, on the Citadel, uh, but still, there is still, there is a lot to be done to preserve and maintain the preservation of the Citadel. This is a fortress that is in the first capital of Port-au-Prince. There are five like this ones built on the top of the mountains and they are in dire need of preservation. Uh, this is the 1799 uh, fortress that was built by the British in uh, the tip of the Northwest Island uh, also in dire need of renovation. This is the portal of the fortress. And in 2009, the government was building that road in the mountain and discovered this coffee plantation that they're trying to see how far back it, we, it, we, it, uh, it is in time and also this fortress. So only in uh, 2009, the government <laughs> discovered, and, and we Haitian, I, I, I was in government at the time, we had never heard of this, plan, of this uh, fortress. There, ha there were no pictures of it. Uh, so we believe that in Haiti there are other riches of the kind, 
that needs to be discovered. So this, is, this was to show you a few of the monuments and sites that we have that go as far back as the, some of them 16, 17, 18, 19th centuries and that need to be preserved. Only in the 1930s did the president ask parliament to pass a law about urban development that included the refurbishing of all monuments about public squares that were built and a new set of rules accompanied the law about the necessary trinal refreshing of old city houses. Since the 1820s, when Haitian lawmakers, lawmakers adopted the Napoleon Code, all our laws derive from that matrix which defines the prerogative of the public sector with regard to historical heritage. Among, and it's only in 1979, as I said, that the Institute for the Preservation of National Heritage was created. And among that institute mandate uh, was to promote and develop public and private activities dedicated to the promotion and the protection of various specific aspects of the national heritage and to contribute to the improvement and the diffusion of all information about national heritage for all organizations as well as individuals, private and public. It's the first time that the private sector was considered in a mandate from a public institution. Despite the fact that ISPAN's mission covers private initiatives, practically no civil society organization or private citizen or private sector enterprise benefited from their expertise. There was already much to do with the public monuments and sites that were in such in dire needs of restoration. The devastating earthquake of January 12, 2010 was going to create an unforeseen opportunity for the, for the creation of a community of resources to save and preserve an exceptional urban heritage. In April 2010, the World Monuments Fund sent a team of ECOMOS experts to assist ISPAN and FOCAL to make an inventory of the gingerbread houses in a perimeter of Port-au-Prince delineated by the two institutions. The first step in an unusual collaboration. This is an excerpt from their report. In October 2009, that was before the earthquake. The gingerbread houses of Haiti were included on the 2010 World Monuments Fund's watch list to raise international awareness about this unique architectural heritage. Many of these once elegant turn of the century structures, detailed with fretted wood and intricate lattice work, had fallen into dis disrepair. While political instability and economic strife had precluded substantive preservation efforts in recent decades, the Haitian Leadership Education Program brought the gingerbread houses to the attention of the World Monuments Fund in the hopes of generating support for the revi revitalization of these important buildings and communities. Less than three months later, the devastating earthquake all but shattered the Haitian people and the places they hold dear. Global response to the disaster was profound and many cultural heritage organization, mo organizations mobilized quickly to aid in the recovery process. Though many of the gingerbread houses suffered significant damage, their traditional construction proved seismically resistant and very few collapsed. Fondation Connaissance et Liberté, in partnership with HELP, then spearheaded a proposal to broad, for broad revitalization of the gingerbread neighborhood 
liaising with FOCAL, the International Council of Monument and Site, ECOMOS, and ISPAN in Haiti, work to implement an initial assessment of the gingerbread houses to determine needs and conditions and to jumpstart the broader rehabilitation effort. Qualified human resources coming from national and international institutions were at the core of this project. HELP, WMF, Prince Klaus Fund, who funded the World Monuments Fund for Haiti, ICOMOS, ISPAN, FOCAL, and universities in Haiti, architectural schools in two universities, including the one I teach. I don't teach, I don't teach uh, architecture, I teach history and economics. We all shared a common understanding of the importance and meanings of saving and preserving the gingerbread houses. Our main task from there on was to raise consciousness in civil society and mobilize the appropriate human and financial resources. At Focal, we acquired an old gingerbread house and turned it into a craftsman school for artisans. Twelve young men from four vocational schools became our interns and under the leadership and supervision of the World Monuments Fund and the Wallon Heritage Institute and Focal, they undertook the challenging task of renovating the gingerbread houses. I will show you a few of the houses and all those pictures were taken after the earthquake. So this is... Uh, the type of houses we're talking about. And in the perimeter that was delineated by ISPA and ourselves, the, the ECOMOS expert architect, restoration architects that were sent by the World Monuments Fund, um, they inventoried over 240 houses. So this is a type of, and this house, for instance, was totally untouched by the earthquake. And I think they analyze in their, uh, in their inventory all the factors. They, they are a large one, they are small ones, and this one also untouched, this one untouched by the earthquake, this one untouched by the earthquake. And uh, all these houses were still in good shape after the earthquake, except for whatever degradation existed prior to the earthquake. And this is the one we bought. We bought this one and it became the artisan school. Actually, the owner of the house said he was going to destroy it because he said they, all the Haitian architects said there was no need to restore that house. And it's when the preservation architects came and one of them is Randolph Lendenbach. I think he teaches at Berkeley University. We had one from Berkeley another one from UCLA, one from Chicago, one from Texas, and one from uh, Massachusetts. And they all said, listen, if he sells you that, that, that property cheap enough, buy it and let's make a school out of it. There is a big issue of qualified preservation architects in Haiti, and there is a big issue of non-existent craftsmen in restoration in Haiti. So when we decided to purchase that house, this picture was taken just a few days after the earthquake, this one also. And this one was taken by Randolph. I didn't give him credit, I'm sorry, but I want to say loudly that this picture was taken by Randolph. Uh, and uh, Randolph and the other architects said, uh, let's make a school, let's train artisans. So we went to four vocational schools and we chose the, the, the last um, year students, uh, 12 young men, and uh, we asked them if they would like to become interns in this uh, process. They accepted and we started the renovation process with the support on the architectural side by the World Monuments Fund, and on the master skills from the Belgian Institute. They send us 
uh, master masons, master carpenters. Ma uh, we also had to fight against termites, so they sent specialists in termites uh, because there is a lot of wood in those houses. And uh, this is our young man trying to work on an orchid. I missed uh, the, my my predecessor on this podium, unfortunately, I was giving an interview. But uh, it seems that what he said from, from the last uh, piece I've got has a lot to do with craftsmanship and local material. So these young men are renovating by the state of the art the, the house, and it has become a center for Lots of local people to visit. We have open, open house day. The World Monument Fund has sent us, uh, I think he's here, Will is here, uh, 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 an alumni who is drafting, actually documenting the whole process. We're going to publish the documentation on the whole process with pictures, with sketches, and with explanation, scientific explanation of what these uh, young people are doing on the supervision of uh, so they, they work uh, five days a week some of them are still in school and all the mat all the bricks there is no brick factory in Haiti all the bricks are used bricks that they have recuperated from other houses that collapsed and we use them and they, they that's what uh, they've been doing and uh, it's fascinating, really. I'm extremely proud of what they've been able to do. It's been difficult because they had absolutely no skill, no know-how in, in, in restoration, and they've been able to work really hard to understand. Actually, last year, I sent them in Belgium so that they could go and spend two weeks there and work on limestone mostly because Everything there is done, there is no cement. Everything is done in limestone. And uh, so they could go and work with wood and limestone. They spent two weeks at the Institut du Patrimoine Wallon. And uh, this is the master mason trying to explain to them how they, they have to curve the bricks and uh, work on the, so they, they really, it's, it's an amazing, uh, and I meet with them very frequently. That's me in the back there talking to them and stimulating them because we want to finish the restoration by January 12, 2015, which will be five years exactly after the earthquake. And uh, so they consult. And, and what resourcefulness is about is their capacity sometimes to find themselves uh, the solution to a problem that could not be solved, could not be solved uh, otherwise. Because we don't have the planes of, uh, of that house. And uh, it was very important that at one point, they discussed themselves about the possibility of restoring the house. For instance, now there is a big, this is, this is the facade that has been uh, totally renovated. Now they're working on the other facade and um, they are facing uh, some difficulty with the pillars because they cannot find pictures of the old house close enough that gives the details of how the pillars were built. So there is a lot of discussion and they Skype with the guy in Belgium, they Skype with the, the right to will, they discuss about this, they call on other people to help <coughs> figure out how to come up with the proper solution that at the same time, this morning there was a lot of discussion about authenticity, but at the same time when you don't have the exact way it was done, it's just a matter of making it cl as close as possible, but at the same time effective and aesthetic. Now, another one before I close. But what I want to say about this experience is that at the beginning, our young men, but so many people in that project and around that project 
were skeptical. They had doubts about the outcome of what, hap what appeared to be a far-reaching utopian endeavor. But as we got more and more involved in the transformation process, they experienced a profound change of mind, a change of behavior, a sense of pride when visitors from different horizons started to praise the work done in newspapers, on the radio, on TV, and in all the social networks. They build their own argument against those who constantly refer to the country as the poorest in the hemisphere, and who would too often raise the stereotype questions. Why spend money and energy in renovating an old gingerbread house while people in this country are destitute, jobless, homeless, and hungry? It is quite established now that in order to come out of destitution and extreme poverty, there needs to be a conjunction of elements that have to do with public policies, investment, macroeconomic analysis, good governance, and so forth. However, another important aspect has to do with nourishing the minds, nourishing minds and spirits, fostering creativity and innovation, reinforcing a sense of hope, of ownership, of transmitting knowledge, skills, and access to information and culture. Our young craftsmen experience exemplified the second aspect, the importance of the human factor and its resourcefulness. They are now able to verbalize how they internalize a very complex process of learning skills, responsibility, and collective actions, of experiencing trust from others, but also from measuring what their own hands and brains are capable of. In addition, through a very personal experience, they discovered the value of a series of aesthetic elements in our culture and came to a personal understanding of how historical heritage can be part of our common identity. They now conceive of historical heritage as not just for the happy few, but also as a common good, and feel it is their duty to make it, know, to make it known as widely as they can. A very moving experience that contaminated all of us, Haitians, as well as foreigners involved in the preservation project, but also Haitian architecture students who were also experiencing this kind of experience, this kind of process. Before I conclude, I would like to mention Foucault's other project, where in this case also, the conjunction of resources gave birth to a most daring sense of beauty in a country that faces massive environmental degradation that was the creation of a natural public park. In 2007, thanks to Foucault's advocacy, I myself was very involved in it, the government of Haiti, I was not in the government at the time, the government of Haiti turned a series of wooded private properties into state-owned properties and entrusted Focal with the mission to create a public park. The contract with the government also stated that we were to improve the living conditions of the neighborhood population who for decades was suffering for, from urban insecurity caused by gang violence and total neglect from public instances. A real challenge indeed. There were not many examples of public-private partnerships that resulted in a formal agreement. We have a contract and a long-term vision. We decided to demonstrate how through the introduction of the concept of practical experience of public space, public space, 
new concept in this environment. And by creating a common heritage, we could transform a lawless, neglected, and destitute neighborhood into a relatively secure, hospitable, and attractive place surrounding a park open to all. Catherine Dunham, an Afro-American anthropologist, came to work on a thesis in Haiti in 1930 in the 1930s, I think 1932 or 35. Her discovery of Haitian voodoo songs and dances led her later to create her own dance company. I think it has influenced all the dance company in, in New York, at least. I know Alvin Ailey, Dance Theater of Harlem were highly influenced by Catherine Dunham Dance Company and of Hollywood fame. In the early 50s, she acquired three pieces of property in the Marty San neighborhood, which is not too far from the center of Port-au-Prince, that became her second home. The fourth property was owned by famous Cornell graduate Haitian architect, Haitian architect Albert Mangones, whose own house in Marty San was built as a model of modern Haitian architecture adapted to the tropical Caribbean climate and lifestyle. Turning these properties into public park, into a public park, was an exhilarating experience and still is. But, but most, the most transformative process was the community dialogue that was conducted during three years with over 3,000 community dwellers. I will show you a few pictures of the Marty Saint Park. It is really a beautiful place. Like when you, when you walk into that neighborhood and you see the difficult sites people are living in and you walk into that place where, which is their park today. We have visitors constantly. And what's very interesting also is what we call the Haitian diaspora all the Haitian living abroad here in New York and Miami and France in Canada and in the island, they are very proud also of this park and they come very often, they support it the way they can and we're trying to see if they can do more. Uh, so these are the, a few pictures of this park which is really a marvelous place that was, uh, that what, that, that is our foundation's work. So lots of young people come to spend time, to study, to meet people. So, and uh, we also have um, medicinal, but because in the, in the executive order that created the park and in our contract with the government, we have to create a small botanical garden because our interest was to save this heritage, the woods, and, uh, but, but uh, most of the work that was done later was done by the foundation. And uh, so we have, uh, we, we, this, this will be the major botanical garden uh, because we just launched a study to get all the work done. And uh, there is a lot of water there are lots of springs in, in that place. And uh, you see this is a waterfalls in the park. And um, we just finished to build this, which is Catherine Dunham Cultural Center. It's a library, it's a um, multi, comment dit ça? Multimedia, multimedia place. It's a library open to, to the public. And just behind the library, we have, this is the infrastructure of the medicinal plant garden. And uh, there are lots of places where people can, uh, we, we work on this with the, with the botanist. Uh, and uh, every part of the garden has to do with uh, what these uh, plants can do to help uh, whatever disease, uh, whatever disease your body has. So this is really something we are very proud of. Very, very proud of. 
So just like for the gingerbread houses, the conjunction of resources from the state, from foreign donors, we get funding from the EU, the European Union, from the Agence Française du Développement, French Agency for Development, from our own foundation and other donors. We're going to try to tap into other ones. We, we got funding from the government. So from foreign donors from, and partners, from civil society and grassroots organization, together with a willingness to progress with an idea of the common good and of public interest, were conducive to a profound awareness, a sense of self-esteem, of belonging, and of commitment on the part of the community. And when such a community is thus motivated, the effect is contagious. In uh, his famous paper in 1999, culture, historic preservation, and economic development in the 21st century. A Columbia alumni, Donovan Ripkema, wrote about the five senses of quality community. A sense of place, a sense of identity, a sense of evolution, a sense of ownership, and a sense of community. This resonates strongly with what we achieved so far and will continue to pursue. Placing the human factor and its resourcefulness, its capacity to transcend, to create, to innovate at the center of our projects with another sense, the sense of what a German philosopher, Axel Honneth, named a sense of recognition. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, Est-ce que vous pouvez répéter les cinq principes? Allez, cinq principes. Oui, parce que des fois, je, je l'ai. Okay. A sense of place. A sense of identity. A sense of evolution. A sense of ownership. And a sense of community. Je vous en prie. Question over here. Should work. I think if you start, they'll regulate it. Um, shortly after the earthquake, I had the opportunity to go to Port de France as part of a disaster recovery team. And uh, one of the things that struck me at the time was that the, uh, the building codes and the city planning and so much of sort of the infrastructure of the city had to be revisualized and rethought. Can you give us some sense of how that has evolved and where you are in that process? Okay, the Ministry of Public Works, um, together with a series of uh, uh, technicians, you know, we got techni technical assistance from, uh, from the US, from France, from Canada, from, uh, uh, but I think mostly the US, they tried to, first of all, they had a canvas where they tried to identify each house in Haiti uh, based on the level of damage that was caused to the house. So they had a gradation of uh, identification. And indeed, I think they had teams going house by house, putting a label on each house saying, you grade one or two, I think they had, there were five grades. And uh, the, the fifth one 
was the one less damaged. So the one was the one really damaged. Uh, so they did that, and while they were doing that, they worked on a, on a code. But the problem is that most of the houses that collapsed were not built by engineers. They were built by improvised masons. And how do you reach out to people when you have a written code and uh, you don't make enough effort to see how to make this code available to everyone who is building a house? So unfortunately, a lot of houses that collapse are being rebuilt the old way. And uh, only those who can afford it are taking engineers and architects who can apply the codes that have been proposed by the ministry. So it, it's a big issue uh, the, because of the reconstruction. Because you see, when you came for, for the recovery, so the first, the first, I would say, year after the earthquake, the international community thought that what was important was humanitarian aid and shelters. So they did not get involved at all in reconstruction. So they have all these temporary shelters, even schools. So many schools, almost five years after the earthquake, are still in temporary shelters. So the, the big efforts and uh, practically a good part of the money went into humanitarian aid. So there's still a lot to be done in terms of reconstructing based on the codes that have, and the codes are good, you know, I've, I have a copy at the foundation. Whatever they propose is, uh, makes sense and probably the architects and engineers who can use it will probably do a good job, but at the same time, uh, it's, the use is limited. Thank you. Um, so you showed the image of the National Palace that had collapsed after the earthquake. And I, I'm also aware there was like a cathedral in Port-au-Prince that uh, collapsed as well. And was there a push to like restore these monuments to their original condition? Or has there been, because um, they seem like there's a huge public interest in them. Or are there plans to like redesign them anew in a different way now after the earthquake? Now, uh, for the palace, there was, at one point, President, um, the French president, what was his name? Sarkozy. Sarkozy. President Sarkozy had said that France was going to rebuild the National Palace. And I think Haitians were, were a bit <laughs> un <laughs> uneasy. <laughs> they were a bit uneasy. And, and, and indeed, he only said it. There was no effort after that to prove that he could say he could do it. And then Sean Penn, you know, Sean Penn came right after the earthquake and got very involved in the tent cities. You know, he, he himself was running a tent city with about 60,000 people. And in Haiti, he created a major NGO where he's been getting funding from all the major US foundations. And at one point, he had proposed to the government uh, that if he, if he cannot rebuild, <laughs> he can cooperate in the demolition. So indeed, he came with a team and uh, some Haitian architects to see what could be saved from the old structure. And they did recuperate a few parts of the building that they would probably, if it's rebuilt someday, use as memory of this uh, building. And they tore it down entirely. Now, the government has a plan to rebuild all the administrative buildings, because you need all the ministers there were, there were 17 minist ministries, they all collapsed. All, all the ministries collapsed. The, the, the court collapsed, the just, justice palace collapsed. 
So there is a plan to rebuild all those. The ones that are being rebuilt now is um, the Supreme Court, and it's being funded by the Chinese, and, uh, <laughs> and a few other ones being uh, financed by the Venezuelans. But other than that, yes, there is a committee to look over all this and uh, see uh, if it's done properly also, you know, and anti seismic and things like that. But in, in Port-au-Prince, uh, there's still, you can see a lot of, still after five years, you can see the, the damages done by the, by the earthquake. Still. Thank you for your talk. Uh, I'm also an accidental, uh, accidental uh, preservation. Yes, totally. And I, I had a chance to do some of, start to ask me a question about preservation in the Philippines, which, uh, and you raised two points that really uh, echoes some of the question that I encountered when I was in the Philippines, uh, which is also a place colonized for 500, 500 years, uh, major typhoon, earthquake, poverty, and so on. And so you raised two points. One was indifference. Pardon me? Indi indifference, indifference. Like you know, like, like in fact, the, the interest in preservation is relatively new. So in the Philippines, I, I keep hearing that too. It's a very new interest. And the second one is the issue of justification. Mm -hmm. Like how can you justify spending a lot of money on a building when everyone People else has other needs? Yeah. I mean, that's these two questions that if you do any kind of work of preservation in a place like the Philippines, but in, I think in other poor country, people are going to ask you those questions. Yes. And you very eloquently actually answer one, one, how can one respond to that, which is when you talk about the nurturing the spirit, you know, this whole aspect, That's right. That's right. which I think is indeed very, uh, you know, uh, it was very inspiring when you, you mentioned all of this. Uh, another, my question has been, um, I mean, in the context where there is these layers of history, you mentioned them, the Taino, the, the, the slave from Africa. A lot of this building in the Philippines, for example, a lot of people say to me, people are not interested because, you know, it's colonial history. I mean, they don't care to preserve a nice 19th century upper class house, which is, you know. So the focus, I, I was wondering what you think about when we also, aside from preserving those, the citadel and this national palace, which, not ironically, Sarkozy would like want to, you know, I mean, that's... Uh, what about the more intangible aspect of heritage? Is there interest in, in that aspect uh, in IT? You see, I think education is a major issue. You, you cannot think that, and that's the example I gave, you know, Right around the citadel, it's a peasant community. And of course, for years, it didn't mean anything to them. Nobody explained what it was. They knew that there was a king who once built that citadel, but it's a, you know, it's a place where, you know, it doesn't, there is a sense that it exists, that it's there, and perhaps it was important. But if you don't communicate that sense of, of time also. You know, I remember once there was a Guardian, a British newspaper, who asked me that question particularly. But look, look, at, look around you, you know, people are poor, they are hungry, and you're putting money in, in preservation. And I told him what I said today, but I added, but I'm doing it also for the poor. You no, know, it's it is as if you're telling me, why do I know how to read and write when there are so many people around me that do not know how to read and write? Mm -hmm. You see, it's absurd. It is true that people come up constantly with it because 
especially in a country like Haiti, which is seen as the place for humanitarian aid. <laughs> so you, you have to build, that's what I said, you know, these, these young men build their argument. When I last met them last week, they told me, you know, we never, we, we started this project because we were interested, but we had no clue that the transformation that is taking place physically is also taking place in our minds. And to me, that's the biggest témoignage that, that I could hear from, from these young men. And it's the same for anything in a poor country. If, I, if I'm a writer and I write, I write for future generations also. You know, the dialogues of, of Plateau are 2,000 years old, and we're still learning from them. I don't pretend that what I write today will have such uh, destiny. But at the same time, when people are poor, we don't hope that they remain poor for the rest of humanity. We want them to get out of poverty. It might take a long time, but whatever we build today, whatever we restore today, whatever we write today, the archives that will remain will be of use of the new generations. And that is also one argument that we should have in mind. Thank you. Thank you very much. Madam. Oh. Is, this work, is this working? Madam, hi. One last question. Last question. Um, I'm sitting here with a classmates from the preservation class of 1977, who we were all introduced to the Citadel Sans Souci, uh, all the monuments of Haiti by Patrick Delatour, our classmate, who um, is a wonderful person. We've all kept. I know that you know him, and, and uh, he's a wonderful man, and I've kept in touch with him. It's he hard was, to talk about. He Haiti. was he was my minister of tourism. Uh, of tourism, and I visited him <laughs> during that time, and and. Uh, it's just hard to talk about Haiti without getting emotional, but it's, uh, I want to say as a tribute to Professor Fitch and to Patrick, um, listening to a, um, I don't want to say his political background, but there was a man in Austin, Texas, coming to present to all the rich people all the things the NGOs were doing in Haiti, good, bad, and otherwise, and I was invited because of my interest in Haiti, and um, he's flashing through things and being kind of critical, but he flashes a picture of Patrick de la Tour, and he turned to this group and says, this is the hardest working, one of the most effective people in all of recovery in Haiti. This was within a year of the earthquake. And I think it's such a tribute to Professor Fitz that uh, uh, here's someone who's kind of being disagreeable about how things are working, but he lists a preservationist as one of the most effective leaders and getting things done, and it makes us very proud. I think you're here for a reason, as far as I'm concerned. I mean, what, what do you think, in your opinion, that preservationists in this uh, amazing group of people uh, can still do for Haiti, can still teach, can still give. Uh, what are the things that, from your perspective, are missing that uh, there might be resources for right here among us? Thank you for your question. Uh, in all the projects that we, we are engaged in, there is a need for qualified resources. There, there is a need, really for exchange of experience, for debating about the proper solutions. And this has to be done among Haitians, of course, but with the input from people like you, like so many students, teachers, and alumni who are here, who have experience all over the world, and who can contribute to enlarge the views and to come with the proper scientific and technical uh, propositions while trying to also understand our cultural standpoint. So this is one thing that can be eased already because we have, the, we have the partnership with the World Monuments Fund, we have the partnership with the Wallon Institute, uh, but any added value to that would be highly, really highly appreciated. And uh, when professor invited me today, I said maybe that's a good occasion to make a plea and advocate for partnership with us in Haiti. Thank all, you very all much. Us. You see.
folks. Um, we often st uh, speak about preservation historic resources, uh, but we've learned today that those resources are nothing without resourcefulness. And, and resourcefulness is something that uh, is obviously an intangible quality of sorts, but it's certainly related to, to leadership. And when you were talking about intangible qualities that we may find uh, in, in Haiti, I think one of those might be real, real qualities of, of leadership. And that is a lesson that we all may learn. Uh, we, often, we often think that we can contribute but we, um, to, to uh, other places, but here at Columbia, we're really trying to also listen to, uh, to the rest of the world and to learn from what's happening in other places. And uh, we've certainly learned uh, a uh, une leçon magistrale uh, today. So thank you very much, uh, President Pierre-Louis. Thank you all for joining us during the day today. It was a wonderful uh, day of discussion. I certainly feel charged with new ideas and ready for a good drink at the Casa Italiana. So please join us. Thank you.